Good morning. morning. We have any children for Sunday school, uh, they're dismissed. I also would like to add my word to what Brother Orrin has said. I want to thank all of you who worked so hard this week in cleaning and prepping and painting and re-cleaning and many other things. Uh, it, you were a real blessing to the Lord, to our church, and so I want to personally thank you as we prepare for our new location next Sunday. Today we are going to study about one of the most important men in history. He is called by many names. We'll look at a number of those, including the beast uh, and the Antichrist. Revelation 13 is one of the most discussed and written about chapters in the Bible. But I want us to go back just a few books in the New Testament and read just for a moment what the Apostle John wrote in his first letter to Christians near the end of the first century about this man we're going to be studying. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. John writes, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. We know from this that it is the last hour. Now, if John told these first century Christians that they were living near the last hour of history, and that was 2,000 years ago. How much closer must that last hour be now in the time in which we live? So that's, that's good news because it means Jesus will be coming soon. But I want you to notice what John, how he phrases this. As you have heard, Antichrist is coming. John is clear that for Christians and churches at the end of the first century, they were teaching about Antichrist. And I think that that is a real rebuke to contemporary Christians and churches who refuse to teach Bible prophecy or the book of Revelation. So here at Lafayette Bible Chapel, we are following John's example. So to do that, let's... Uh, go back to the last verse of Revelation chapter 12, look at that, and then on into 13 to the passage that we will be studying today. Would you follow with me? Revelation 12, 18. And he, the dragon, stood on the sand of the sea, verse 1 of chapter 13. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads. On his horns were ten diadems, royal crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. The beast I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like a bear's, and his mouth was like a lion's mouth. The dragon, or Satan, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. One of his heads appeared to be fatally wounded. But his fatal wound was healed. The whole world was amazed and followed the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war against him? Verse 5, a mouth was given to this beast to speak boasts and blasphemies. He was also given authority to act for 42 months or three and a half years. He began to speak blasphemies against God, to blaspheme His name and His dwelling, those who dwell in heaven. And He was permitted to wage war against the saints and to conquer them. He was also given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All those who live on the earth will worship Him that is, everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slaughtered. If anyone has an ear, he should listen. If anyone is destined for captivity, into captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he will be killed. This demands the perseverance and faith of the saints. Would you join me as we commit this message to the Lord in prayer? Father, I just want to add my thanks to you as Brother Oren prayed for the five and a half years that you have given us here at um, this uh, marvelous place. I thank you for its heritage and there's so many memories we take with us. We are appreciative to you for those. 
And Lord, I, as we leave, I want you to ask that you would bless Christ Church Academy as they seek to uh, teach children Christian education from a Christian worldview and a biblical worldview. Lord, I would pray the same for our homeschool families, that you would strengthen them, and especially the moms and others who teach the children, that they would be very diligent, that they would work very hard, and that they would do a good job to prepare uh, their children, our children, for uh, life in the future. And Lord, I would also pray for our public schools. I pray for Patrick, who is in public school, for the many children in our city and parish who go to public schools. Thank you that we, there are Christian and godly teachers scattered through public schools. We pray you would strengthen and protect them as well um, so that uh, the children would receive uh, the knowledge that they need to. And so now, Lord, I commit this message to you, and I pray that you would give me the balance not just to focus on this evil man and his inspiration, uh, the devil, but, Lord, also to see in this passage how this also reveals the Lord Jesus Christ because this book is about a revelation of Him. So we commit this to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I want to begin with a chart that helps us to understand how Antichrist fits into God's prophetic forecast of history. So if you'll look at this with me, going back to the Old Testament, to Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2, then the vision that Daniel has later in chapter 7, comparing it to John's vision of the beast that we're about to study in Revelation 13. The head of gold that, Dan, that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream was Babylon, modern Iraq. But later, uh, Daniel saw the same thing pictured as an eagle with two wings. And the characteristic, notice, like a lion, fits in with this same idea of Babylon. We'll talk in a moment about that. Then Medo-Persia, which is based in modern Iran the chest and arms of silver in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, a bear with three ribs in his mouth in Daniel's vision, and notice this beast that's coming is like a bear. And then Greece, this uh, great country from the past, the stomach and thighs of bronze in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, pictured as a leopard with four wings because Alexander's empire was divided among four generals. And then notice again that in John's vision, this uh, beast is like a leopard. So we'll talk in a moment that the characteristics of these first three empires are found in the beast. Then finally, Rome, the two legs of iron in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the beast or monster that Daniel sees in chapter 7. And we find here that this beast had 10 horns. The uh, statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream was feet of iron mixed with clay with 10 toes. But so we have a very similar play on that with seven heads, ten horns, ten diadems in John's vision. We'll look at it in a moment. The Antichrist is not specifically mentioned in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but he's pictured as a little horn in Daniel's vision and, of course, the beast from the sea in the vision we're going to look at today. One more chart. And here we go, we go vertical instead of horizontal. And here are some names of the Antichrist through Scripture. Again, the little horn in Daniel 7. In Gabriel's prophetic calendar that we see in Daniel 9, the coming prince, also the desolator, two different names for him. Jesus' prophecy on the Mount of Olives uh, before he was crucified, Matthew 24, also Luke and uh, uh, Mark, abomination of desolation is what he does, so he would be the abominator. Paul's prophecy in 2 Thessalonians 2, he's called the man of sin or man of lawlessness and the son of destruction, older translation, son of perdition. And then in John's letter, we already saw in 1 John 2, called Antichrist, and then we've already read here in Revelation 13 in John's vision, the beast from the sea. I know that went fast, but again, I give you the notes either by email or in person, and all the verses that back up these various uh, things that I'm showing you, I give you in the notes. Now let's try to understand seven basic truths or ideas from this passage in Revelation 13 about the Antichrist. First, what is the relationship between the dragon or Satan and the beast? Remember last week as we finished Revelation 12, we saw that Satan or the dragon was cast out of heaven to the earth at the midpoint of the seven years of tribulation. And so it is Satan that we have read who will give the beast his power. 
his throne, that is his kingdom, and his authority. But in actuality, this future Antichrist will merely be Satan's agent on earth. He will be Satan's puppet to carry out his blasphemous agenda. Notice in this passage the word blasphemous, blasphemies, or blaspheme occurs four times. It's a theme that runs all through this. Satan's goal, one of his many goals, is to show great disrespect and dishonor to God. So really, Satan will be the ultimate mastermind behind the beast's future worldwide reign, rebellion, and blasphemy against God. A second idea or fact we look at about the beast in this passage, what is he? What is the beast? And this is, I think, it's very important. John sees a vision of a fearsome monster, but that's a symbol for both the future revived Roman Empire and the man who leads it. Now, Louis XIV, or Louis XIV, had this famous saying in French, l'état c'est moi, or I am the state, identifying himself as France's most powerful monarch with the state that he governed. We see the very same thing, I believe, here in Revelation 13. The beast is both the empire and the man who runs it. Now, each time in history, as there has been a dictator or tyrant arise in the world, Christians who study the Word of God have thought he was the beast. Many emperors could have qualified, including Nero, who was horrible, persecuted the church, tried to wipe it out. Uh, a number of the popes were bad. This particular guy, Urban, one of the worst. Uh, when there was a rebellion against him, he had all the people who rebelled against him tortured, and he complained because their screams weren't loud enough. So it shows you what kind of a guy he was. But Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, up even to Osama bin Laden, uh, and I'm sure before the rapture there will be additional candidates. But also every time there has been a godless or anti-god system that come along, whether it's humanism, communism, Nazism, or Islam, or any of the other isms, people have thought, Christians have thought, that those were the manifestation of the beast. But of course, what we have really been seeing all these years are Satan's dress rehearsals, his warm-ups for the real thing that will happen in the future seven years of tribulation. I went back to my first commentary that I bought when I was in college on the book of Revelation, Salem Kirbin, who was a converted Arab, and he said, absolutely, communism has to be the fulfillment of the beast. Well, 40 years later, uh, we see that communism didn't shape up to be what people thought it was, and now Islam uh, is, appears to be conquering the world. So the final form of this beast regime and dictator uh, may very well be different from anything that we have seen so far, but it will be a culmination of those. A third question, where does this beast come from? In John's vision, he sees the beast coming up out of the sea. And Revelation 17, Isaiah 17, I'll give you the references in the notes, tell us that unbelieving Gentile nations are before God like the restless sea, always turbulent. Also, the book of Revelation in chapters 11 and 17 tell us that the beast comes up from the abyss. So this is not a contradiction if you understand from the Old Testament, Job, Isaiah, other places, including Romans 10 and the New, that the sea and the abyss are often interchangeable, poetically, symbolically, and literally, uh, where monstrous creatures, monstrous men, are unleashed upon the world to oppose God and His people. So, very, very interesting history that we don't have time to go into, the relationship of the sea and the abyss. Now, almost all interpreters of the book of Revelation, whatever uh, their opinion or interpretation of the book, they believe that the beast represents some form of the Roman Empire, whether it's past, future, or both. I think that's really amazing. And here I'm showing you a chart of what the Roman Empire looked like when it was at its greatest um, peak as an empire. It included what we now call Western Europe. It included North Africa, the Middle East, including Israel, and Asia Minor up into what is now the Russian Federation between the Caspian and Black Seas. Now, 
I then would uh, conclude that the uh, beast or any Christ will probably be a Gentile, perhaps from one of these nations that ring the Mediterranean Sea or close by. But remember, God has the flexibility to fulfill these prophecies as He chooses. So it's possible that rather than coming directly from one of these countries, the beast, Antichrist, could simply be a descendant born elsewhere in the world from one of these countries. So God has the right to fulfill this as He chooses. But I want you to, point, to look at one interesting thing. Islam controls everything in North Africa, everything in the Middle East, except Israel, coming around to Turkey. But then if you look at all these nations up to England, France, Spain, Italy, all, Greece, all these, the largest minority in every one of those countries is currently, are currently Muslims, the largest minority. So uh, <clears throat> we see trends, but of course, at one point in the future, God will make it happen the way He so chooses. One interesting insight from the history of this Mediterranean area, when John first wrote the book of Revelation, and people saw the Roman sailing ships coming towards them across the Mediterranean, the ships appeared to literally rise out of the sea because of the curvature of the earth. And so if you've ever been at sea, you see this phenomena, how it looks like the ship is coming up or going down over the horizon. And here's the math, which I can't do, but it can be done. Um, so I don't think it's too far-fetched that there could literally be in the future Antichrist sailing across the Mediterranean. Go back to the map, Patrick. Sailing across the Mediterranean, for example, to Israel, to Joppa on the coast, that if he was in a ship it could literally look like he was coming up in the ship out of the sea. So I never try to turn too loose of the literal if there is a way uh, to do that. A fourth question, let's go forward now. What do the parts of the beast symbolize? Now, Bible students disagree on many of the details, but I would side with most of the classic interpreters of this chapter that the seven heads are perhaps the seven major anti-God nations in biblical history, past and future, that persecute God's people. And those would be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, all of which are talked about in the Bible, and the future revived Roman Empire, the beast spoken of in biblical prophecy. Then the ten horns and ten diadems seem to be ten kings, perhaps also their ten kingdoms, that will be part of the future empire of the beast. And if we look, uh, as we study uh, Revelation chapter 17 about Babylon, we'll get into more detail because John goes into more detail in that chapter. Now, the leopard, the beast, and lion, as I showed you earlier in the chart, echo the animal-like traits of those three pre-Roman nations in Daniel's vision in chapter 7, which would be the leopard being like Greece, the bear like Persia or modern Iran, the lion like uh, Babylon or modern Iraq. A major point, regardless of the details, of John's vision is that this future revived Roman Empire will culminate, it will encapsulate the worst features of all previous world dictatorships and regimes, and so it will be the worst of all of them. A fifth point that we need to look at in this chapter, what is the beast's head wound that is healed? Now, boy, there's been a lot of ink uh, uh, written and printed on this one. Let's go back and reread verses 3 and 4. One of his heads appeared to be fatally wounded, but his wound was healed. His fatal wound was healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast like lemmings. The worship, they worshiped the dragon because he gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? All it faults is putting his name in the blank. Now, some interpreters think that this is referring to this future Roman state's miraculous revival, which would amaze people, or perhaps it's preservation in some future battle or war. But I think this verse, these verses are talking about Antichrist himself, the man. Verse 3 says that this head wound, notice, appears to be fatal, 
but then it is heal. So whether Antichrist is actually killed and resurrected or is near death and survives, this seems to be Satan's imitation of Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, no Bible verse states that God cannot give Satan the ability, at least for a short time, to raise the dead. There's discussion about that. But whether it's an imitation, resurrection, or the real thing, the result is the same. Antichrist, who will already have been in power in the world for three and a half years as a leader probably of world peace, he will be catapulted to worldwide fame. And whether or not people realize it, some will, but not maybe all, they will be worshiping the beast and Satan the dragon who gives him his power. Imagine what would have happened in 1963. I was a little boy, seven years old, when JFK suffered his fatal head wound in Dallas. What would have happened if he had miraculously survived? The whole world would have proclaimed him as a modern-day Messiah. Well, I think something like that may well happen to turn this beast overnight into the absolute darling and dictator of the world. And if this is a battle wound that he gets, then that could explain why they say, who can do battle with the beast? Because how could you possibly defeat an enemy whose leader can be resurrected or at least come back from the brink like this? Now, I want to take you on a little trip to the Old Testament for a moment. The question people will ask, who is like the beast? You remember reading something like that in the Old Testament? It's a ripoff of Old Testament questions about God. Let's look at those. Exodus 15, 10, when Moses and the children of Israel are on the other side of the Red Sea, and they uh, praise the Lord in this great song, but you, Lord, blew with your breath... And the sea covered the Egyptians. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Lord, who is like you among the gods of Egypt that you've defeated? Psalm 89.8, Lord, Yahweh, God of hosts of the armies of heaven, who is strong like you, Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule. You're the king of the raging sea. When its waves, waves surge, you still them. I think that that's actually a prophecy or prediction of Jesus stilling the storm in the Gospels. Micah chapter 7, 18. How much do you read Micah? Who is a God like you, removing iniquity and passing over rebellion for the remnant of His inheritance, speaking of Israel? He does not hold on to His anger forever because He delights in faithful love. He will again have compassion on us, which is a prophecy of the end-time conversion of Israel. He will vanquish our iniquities. I love that. And then you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. What is fascinating to me is that every one of these Old Testament verses that ask the question, who is like God, is connected with God's physical, our spiritual rescue of His people related to the sea. Whether the sea is symbolic or whether the sea is literal, it's all talking about how great God is. And of course, where does the beast come from? From the sea. I wish we had time for the backstory of all this, going all the way back to Genesis 1, where God conquers the chaos, conquers the waters and creates through Noah's flood, through the Red Sea, through the Jordan River, through Jesus stilling the storm. There is this thread through Scripture of how God is bigger than the sea. So you don't have to read the book of Revelation to know how this story turns out. You could have figured it out all along because God is in control of the sea and anything that comes out of it. I love that. A sixth question, what is the political and religious agenda of the beast and his empire? Let's again read these verses. They're so important. Verse 5, a mouth was given to the beast to speak boasts, and blasphemies. Dr. Toussaint from Dallas Seminary, who is a great old style teacher, said one of the biggest characteristics of the Antichrist is he's got a big mouth. He was also given authority to act for 42 months, three and a half years. He began to speak blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his dwelling, those who dwell in heaven, notice, not just God. 
And he was permitted to wage war against the saints and to conquer them. He was also given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All those who live on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slaughtered. Basically, if you could sum up this paragraph, the beast will be like a mad dog on a short leash. Four times, notice it says, was given, was given, was permitted, was given. We have studied that phrase earlier, chapter 6, chapter 9. This isn't just talking about Satan giving him authority. This is God allowing these things to happen, just like God allowed the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, so God allows Antichrist to do these various various things, this short-lived reign of terror over the world. Only three and a half years. Think about that. That's less than one of our presidential terms. Praise the Lord. Look at one more chart to sort of weave all of this together. I and most of us here believe the rapture of the church is the next event on God's prophetic timetable. He will take every true believer out of this world. Then, perhaps hours, days, weeks, months, the first true event of the tribulation will be the Antichrist signs a treaty, a covenant with Israel, which will then give them the protection to rebuild the temple, reestablish worship in Jerusalem. During this first three and a half years, remember, the seal judgments fall, the trumpet judgments fall, so the world is going to be in chaos. And so all along, Antichrist or this beast, he'll be a man of peace, probably championing relief efforts, uh, helping people who have lost everything they had in those judgments. But then the game changer is here at the three and a half year mark. This is where I think he will kill the two witnesses uh, that have been wreaking havoc on earth also, and he will break his covenant with Israel, and we will study next week about how he sets up an image in the temple in Jerusalem and the false prophets, uh, who's sort of like his lieutenant or prime minister, we'll talk about him next week, and of course, the big number, 666. So whatever this assassination attempt or real assassination, it changes everything, and it is even possible that from this point on, the beast or Antichrist will himself be possessed by Satan like Judas Iscariot was. Uh, and that the, from the last three and a half years, he will rule absolutely the world. This is the great tribulation Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24, and Jesus will put an end to all of it at his second coming uh, where he defeats both the beast and false prophet. As I said, Antichrist will be the biggest braggart in history, talking about himself. In other words, he'll be the best politician who ever lived. He will blaspheme God and those in heaven. You recall at the end of the sixth seal uh, in Revelation chapter 6, how people will recognize that these judgments falling are from God. We'll see that again, that they will blaspheme God in chapter 16 during the bold judgments. But here, the Antichrist will give voice to the people in the world who are, want to strike back at God. And so they will probably cheer him. The beast will persecute and martyr many, many true believers during this tribulation period, early in it and later. And he will be worshipped, but by unbelievers, notice. Now, Revelation 17, 8 does tell us that the names of these people were not written from the foundation of the world, but here in this particular chapter... I want to go against the Holman Christian Standard Bible, against the New American Standard, if you have that, against most of the modern translations, ESV. And I want to go, let's go forward, Patrick, to what is found in NIV, King James, and New King James. Notice the wording here in Holman, which I normally use, NASB, ESV. Written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who slaughtered. The Greek word order is here, NIV. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All those whose names were written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the foundation or creation of the world. This phrase belongs with the lamb who's slain because that's the Greek word order. But all the other translations decided to do it differently because of 
chapter 17, it tells us it's the book of life too. So both are true. Both the book of life written from the foundation of the world and the lamb slain. They're both true, but this passage, King James, New King James, NIV, I believe, are right. Satan's ultimate target during these years of the tribulation will be the gospel because it's only the people who reject the gospel who are going to worship him. So he's going to try to get rid of anybody who truly believes in the real gospel. One last point, number seven. The focal point of this passage, don't miss this, is to warn believers at all times, especially those who live in the future tribulation, to accept, submit to God's will in persecution and in martyrdom. Now, Revelation 13, 9 says, if anyone has an ear, he should listen. You remember that phrase? We studied it seven times when we studied Jesus' letters to the seven churches. So let's look at what Jesus said earlier in those seven letters. Anyone who has an ear should listen and adds to what the Spirit says to the churches. But very interesting, the word church never appears again in Revelation after chapter 3 and all until all the way over to chapter 22. And I think the reason is the church will not be on earth during those seven years of tribulation. So we have just the phrase... If anyone has an ear, he should listen. But the rest of that that we're encouraged to submit to is in verse 10. If anyone is destined for captivity, into captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he will be killed. This demands the perseverance and faith of the saints. God tells believers at all times, especially those saints who will someday live during the tribulation, to submit to what God allows to happen in our lives. If you can flee, Jesus tells people in Jerusalem, flee. But if you can't, let them capture you. Let them arrest you. If that is what God has ordained, don't resist it. And even if it means them killing you, if you can't get away, accept God's will to become a martyr if God has so decreed that. We demonstrate as Christians our perseverance and our faith by submitting to God's sovereign will in our lives. That doesn't mean we don't make plans. It doesn't mean that we don't try to fight diseases or to better ourselves. But when push comes to shove and God has sovereignly allowed something, be it an illness, be it a death, be it a loss of a job, we should accept that from God's gracious hand and trust Him and ask Him to help us to persevere faithfully so we, so we will show the world the character of Christ who was the ultimate person who submitted to evil, the cross. And it's interesting, this word, killed by the sword, how is ISIS beheading people in the world now with a sword? One of the most amazing things that could show how this will be fulfilled in a few years, I don't know. I don't want this sermon to glorify the devil, so I want to show you one more chart that contrasts the beast with the true Messiah, the anti-Messiah and the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at this. I love this. Christ, seed of the woman, antichrist, seed of the serpent. Jesus came from above, the beast came from the abyss. Jesus came to do his Father's will, antichrist will come to do his own will. Jesus came to save, the beast comes to destroy. Jesus humbled himself, Antichrist exalts himself. Jesus was despised, Antichrist will be admired. Jesus will be exalted, Antichrist will be thrown into hell. Jesus is the good shepherd, Antichrist is the worthless shepherd. Jesus is the truth, the beast is the lie. Jesus is the holy one. Satan is, or the beast filled with Satan is the lawless one. Jesus, a man of sorrows. The beast, the man of sin. Jesus, the son of God. Antichrist, son of destruction. Jesus shows the mystery of godliness. Antichrist shows the mystery of iniquity. I want to give you a little carrot, a little incentive to come next week to our new location because we're going to study the end of this chapter with the image of the beast, false prophet, and the number 666. I'll try to survive the study of it, and I think you'll really enjoy that as an interesting study next week. I'm not going to end this sermon here 
at our beloved Willow Street Chapel talking about the Antichrist. What I want to close is with our finest heritage that we've had for five and a half years here and for the last 16, 17 years as a church. The heart of God's Word is the gospel, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world that makes it possible for our names to be in the book of life and the foundation of the world. One of the most important English poets between Pope and Wordsworth was William Cowper. Now, in Britain, his last name is pronounced Cooper. But, so I won't confuse you, I'll stick to our American mispronunciation, Cowper. A Brit might say, well, what else is new? (laughs) William's mother died when he was six, and his callous father banished him to a British boarding school where he was bullied and beaten without mercy. William attempted suicide several times in his life and was committed to what was cruelly called at that time a lunatic asylum. But while he was mentally ill in that asylum, God and His providence let William read the most important paragraph in the Bible, the most important paragraph that has ever been written, Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, and I'm going to read it. Every Christian should read this paragraph at least once a year. It could benefit us to read it even more often. But now, Paul says, apart from the law, God's righteousness, the key word of Romans, God's righteousness, has been revealed, attested by the law and prophets, that is the Old Testament, that is God's righteousness, again, through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified, that is, declared righteous legally, freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him, Christ, as a propitiation. That big word, propitiation, means an atoning sacrifice that removes God's wrath from us through faith in His blood, to demonstrate what? God's righteousness, because in His restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed because of the cross work of Christ. God presented Christ to demonstrate His righteousness, that word again, at the present time, so that God would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Is it any wonder that Satan and the beast will try to destroy anyone who understands and believes this transforming truth in this paragraph? These words reveal that there is nothing more God can do to save us than what He has already done in Christ. And when Cowper read these words, he later wrote, let's read what he wrote. Immediately he says, I receive strength to believe And the full beams of the Son of Righteousness, Jesus, shone upon me. I saw the sufficiency of the atonement Christ made, my pardon in His blood, and the fullness of complete justification. In a moment, I believed and received the gospel. And by the way, this paragraph that we just saw in Romans 3 was the same paragraph that converted John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Do you understand what that paragraph describes? Put it back up, Patrick. It's the most important paragraph in the Bible, the most important paragraph in the world. There is nothing you need to do to get God's forgiveness for your sins because God has already done everything when Jesus died for you on the cross. Just believe He did that. Trust in Him who has already shed His blood to remove God's wrath because of our sins, to justify us, to declare us righteous forever. And the question is, do you believe God did that for you in Christ? As a Christian, Cowper still struggled with bouts of anxiety, with depression. And yet, in the years after that, God enabled him to write many great hymns. William was befriended by John Newton, author of the hymn Amazing Grace. And together, William and John Newton worked in the abolitionist movement, and William wrote many anti-slavery poems, which were later used in the 1960s by Martin Luther King Jr. in the civil rights movement. Cowper's most well-known hymn 
was composed in 1779, just three years after the Declaration of Independence. There is a fountain filled with blood. Think you know it? I'm going to show you the original version that he wrote as we close, uh, and then we're going to sing it, I believe. So stay with me to the end and pay attention, please. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief on the cross rejoiced to see that fountain of Christ's blood in his day, and there have I, says William and Frank, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Brothers and sisters, God saved us to stop sinning. We keep doing it. But the purpose of the cross isn't just to forgive us, it's to make us stop sinning. Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply, Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. And now the two verses we don't sing. Lord, I believe thou hast prepared, unworthy though I be, for me a blood-bought free reward. (laughs) <laughs> a golden harp for me, tis strung in tune for endless years and formed by power divine to sound in God the Father's ears no other name but thine. As we move to our new church home today and as we start meeting there next week, may the truth of this hymn the truth of that astonishing paragraph in Romans 3, the truth that God will best the lamb or best the beast and Satan. May that truth go with us now and forever. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you that we belong to you. And it's not about a place, though we're very thankful for this place but it's about that we belong to you through the blood, the sacrifice, the propitiation of the Lord Jesus in what he has done for us now and forever. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.